If you want to write a story, you have to know what a story is and how to structure it. Hey, it's Megan. Welcome back to On Writing. Let's talk about story structure, specifically the five-act structure. The five-act structure has been used for centuries. The earliest example we have is actually from Horace, who said a play should not be shorter or longer than five acts. And it turns out he kind of knew what he was talking about. The five acts can be seen in ancient Greek and Roman plays like Oedipus and Medea, but actually structuring a play around the five acts didn't become popular until the Renaissance era, when playwrights were looking back at those classical works for inspiration. When we see the five acts coming through in plays like Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet, Dr. Faustus, and those are only from English playwrights. So the point is that this structure has been used for centuries, and so as modern writers, it may be beneficial for us to look at that and go, hmm, maybe there's something I can learn from this. The five acts were later formalized and written about by Gustav Freytag in his 1863 work, Freytag's Technique of the Drama. And this is where we get those familiar classic terms of exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, and resolution, which are what make up Freytag's Pyramid. So what are these five acts and what do these terms mean? Well, first I make a slight adjustment to the five acts and I use exposition, catalyst, rising action, climax, falling action. First we have exposition. This is the beginning of the story where the setting, characters, and basic situation of your story is introduced. It provides all the necessary background information needed for your readers to understand and orient themselves within your story, but its purpose is ultimately to set up and lead to your catalyst. So it is not just a place to dump information, its point should be to give your readers just enough information that they can follow where your character thinks they're going and then have that thwarted by the catalyst. The catalyst is basically the inciting incident of your story. It's the event that sets the main story in motion. So at the beginning of your book, your character thinks they're going in one direction. They think they know the path that their life is going to take. The catalyst is an event that disrupts that and sets them on a different path. It introduces the central conflict of the story and its main purpose is to propel your protagonist into that story. After the catalyst, your main character should wrestle with it a little bit and eventually step into their new path. And so this introduces the rising action. And the rising action is really just a fancy way of saying the story. It's the series of events and complications that will lead your character to the climax of the story. This part of the story is all about character development and how do people develop? How do we learn? How do we grow? How do we change? We do so when we face obstacles and we overcome challenges. So the rising action is all about giving your character different challenges to overcome in order to show how they're growing as a character. The purpose is to build tension, build suspense, show that character development, and lead to the climactic moment of your story. Then we reach that climactic moment moment in the story, it's the most intense moment where the main conflict reaches its peak. It's often the moment of greatest tension, and it's the moment where your main character has to finally face their biggest challenge. And essentially, they have to confront the lesson that they're supposed to learn by the end of the story, in other words, the premise. So by the time they reach the climax, that premise that you've set for your story should start to sink in, and then right after the climax, as they're wrestling with all of what just happened, that's when your premise finally sinks in. After the climax has happened, we get into the falling action. This is also referred to as the denouement, or the resolution of your story, but it basically involves the plan your main character Character makes in response to the climax. So they've just gone through this incredibly intense, emotionally charged event, and they're trying to figure out what do I do now? They've learned the premise, they've realized, oh, I need to really change my ways so that I can avoid going through things like that again. So the purpose of the falling action is to solidify their character development, show what they've learned and how they're changing, and then also resolve any conflicts that have come up throughout the story. You're basically leading the story now to the conclusion. Falling action includes things like the finale, the final battle, and it includes kind of that final exhale of, okay, the story's ending, we see where our character has ended up and how they've been changed, and now the story is closing. So those are the five acts in a nutshell. Now we're gonna look at them in action. Do they still hold up to this day? We're gonna look at Harry Potter 1, and we're gonna look at Harry Potter 2. If you have a copy of these books, go ahead and grab them. Some of the page references may differ, but it just depends on what edition you have. So in this first chapter, we're introduced to the Dursleys, as well as Dumbledore and McGonagall. So we get a perfect balance right away of the magical and non-magical worlds. We get an introduction to how the Dursleys feel about the Potters, and we get an introduction to how the magical world feels about the Dursleys. So how McGonagall in particular has been watching them and observing them. So what you should find is that the exposition takes multiple chapters, whereas the catalyst is really focused in on one chapter. And we get that here. Exposition is chapters one through three, and the catalyst is chapter four, the keeper of the keys. And why is this the catalyst and not the moment when Harry receives his letter? Because that could, that's kind of like a pre-catalyst. 
catalyst. When the letters show up at his house, he's not able to read them. His uncle and aunt constantly get in the way of him actually reading the letters, to the point where they go off to the remote location and try to hide. So again, in the exposition, they're setting up the catalyst. Hagrid wouldn't have to have come and gotten Harry if the Dursleys hadn't been trying to thwart the letters from getting to Harry. So that's how the exposition is not just about introducing the world, but leading up to that catalyst. Then in the catalyst, we see Hagrid presenting Harry with his own letter, telling him he's a wizard, hinting to Harry that there's more to the story of his parents' death than Harry previously thought, and we get Harry debating the catalyst, debating his call to action, in other words. It says questions exploded inside Harry's head like fireworks, and he couldn't decide which to ask first. This is a positive catalyst, so this is something that is going to be welcome in Harry's life to him. So he's not going to wrestle with it in the same way that a protagonist might wrestle with a negative catalyst, one that seems to take them away from the life they want to lead. And then we immediately dive into the rising action. So the rising action should cover the majority of your book. So the rising action really spans chapter five through about chapter 16 before they go through the trap door. <laughs> oh man, so this encompasses all of Harry's new experiences at Hogwarts. He makes his friends, he makes some enemies, he learns about magic, he discovers more about his parents' past, he finds the mirror of Erised, the troll, the Christmas gift of his invisibility cloak, and he and his friends start to investigate the Sorcerer's Stone. So all the while, tension is building through this rising action as the three of them think that Professor Snape is going to steal the Sorcerer's Stone and they decide to stop him. Now the climax again is that most intense moment of the story where the main conflict reaches its peak. It's chapter 17, The Man with Two Faces. This is where Harry, Ron, and Hermione have finally gone through all the obstacles that they're gonna face in the rising action, including the ones that they go through after they're through the trap door, which is always really fun. And then Harry has to confront Voldemort and we realize that it's Professor Quirrell and all of that, yada yada. But within the five act structure, this is the climactic moment of the story because it's the moment of greatest intensity for Harry. It's his biggest challenge out of everything he's gone through in the story. And more importantly, after this moment, there is not a bigger challenge that he faces. And just like we looked at the exposition being multiple chapters and the catalyst being one chapter, you should also see that the rising action is multiple chapters and the climax is one chapter. And actually chapter 17 is the last chapter of the book, which is pretty wild, but how to keep things moving, so great. So the following action in the rest of chapter 17, we get Harry's recovery in the hospital wing, he's reunited with his friends, everyone's okay, but essentially the point of the following action is of course to tie up any loose ends and bring the story to a satisfying close. And like the perfect school age book, it ends perfectly at the end of the school year, waiting for the next book to pick up at the start of the next school year. So let's dive into the second Harry Potter book, The Chamber of Secrets, and see if the five acts hold up in the story as well. Okay, so The Chamber of Secrets similarly opens with a few chapters of exposition. What do we learn there? We see how he's feeling isolated, frustrated, and he receives this warning from this elf, this weird elf named Dobby. He gets a warning that he's not supposed to return to Hogwarts, he shouldn't return to Hogwarts, and essentially the scenes in the exposition are basically re-establishing and reminding us who our main characters are and what life is like for Harry outside of the magical world. And of course, foreshadowing things to come, which we always love. The great thing about this exposition that I want you to take note of is that there's conflict and there's obstacles within this exposition already. You don't have to wait until the catalyst hits to give your main character something to wrestle with. So in chapter two, that's when Dobby comes and gives his warning. Then the Dursleys lock Harry in his room and chapter three is him being busted out by Ron. So there's action, there's obstacles, there's conflict happening even in the exposition and it's all leading up to the catalyst, which we'll see in a moment. So in Harry Potter one, we found that the exposition was chapters one through three and the catalyst was chapter four. Here, the exposition is chapters one through four and the catalyst is chapter five. We love consistency. Really, you should be aiming for your exposition to be about two to four chapters. Just depends on the kind of world you're introducing and what you need to do to set up that catalyst. I would say the exposition is a little bit longer here, probably because it's a sequel, so you don't have to worry as much about whether or not you're gonna get your reader's attention right away. There's also just a little bit more happening in this exposition with Dobby, the Dursleys, going to the burrow, then going to Diagon Alley, 
and then the catalyst. So there's just a little bit more ground to cover. So the catalyst in this story is where Harry and Ron are blocked from accessing platform nine and three quarters. And so they're basically like, how are we gonna get to school? We're kind of screwed. So then they decide, okay, we're gonna take Mr. Weasley's car and fly to Hogwarts ourselves. Why does this catalyst work so well? It is perfectly set up in the beginning of the story through the exposition. In the Chamber of Secrets, we see a lot of things going on in the rising action. Students are being petrified. Messages are written on walls in blood, warning that the Chamber of Secrets has been opened. Like, what does that mean? Harry, Ron, and Hermione are trying to investigate the legend of the chamber and learn more, trying to identify who the heir of Slytherin is. Harry's hearing voices in the walls. There's the discovery of polyjuice potion. And there's also the dueling club incident where Harry speaks parcel tongue without even knowing it. And so everyone starts to think he's the heir of Slytherin. Of course, he finds Tom Riddle's diary and there's, there's a lot packed into this story. It's why it is so good. Don't even get me started on the giant spiders. Oh man. Then the rising action lasts from chapter six through chapter 16 with the climax happening in chapter 17. And really what leads to the climax is realizing that Ginny has been taken into the chamber of secrets. And that happens in chapter 16. But by the time we get to chapter 17, the heir of Slytherin, Harry is confronting Voldemort yet again. Well, actually he's confronting Voldemort yet again and doesn't know it yet again. But basically we see Harry get into the chamber of secrets to rescue Ginny and he confronts Tom Riddle and he confronts the basilisks. So this is the most intense confrontation and conflict in the story. It tests Harry's bravery, it tests his resourcefulness, and it ultimately leads to him defeating the Basilisk. And he destroys Tom Riddle's diary, which will come into play in big ways later in the series, as we all know. But it's the climactic moment of the story because again, it's that moment of greatest tension, and there is no bigger moment of conflict after this scene, which means the falling action is everything that happens after it. If I know JK Rowling, I bet you it's not more than one chapter. Yep. Oh, there's little Megan trying to make sure that the letters actually spell out what she's saying. I think I was like eight when this book came out. Yeah, so chapter 18 then encompasses the entirety of the falling action. That's fast, but it's a kid's book, so you can move at a bit of a quicker pace. You don't always want your falling action to just be one chapter, but I would say no more than maybe three or four. You kind of want to balance it with your exposition, but it just depends on how much time you need to resolve all your conflicts. And truthfully, the faster you can do that, the better. So the falling action is where the truth about the chamber and the diary is revealed to all. Everything returns back to normal at Hogwarts. The petrified students are revived. Everyone understands the mystery now and the events that have transpired. I mean, basically Harry's done with his second year and off he goes back home to the Dursleys. So that is how the five acts play out in Harry Potter one and two. The tricky thing with the five acts, and this is why I teach my writers a bit of a different process as we work on their outlines together, it leaves a really big gaping hole in the middle. <laughs> the rising action kind of ends up feeling like, what do I do here? So the way I teach my writers, we break down the exposition, the rising action and the falling action into chunks that each have a specific purpose. And that makes it a little bit easier to figure out, especially if you've never written a story before. If you want to learn how to do that, you can join the Novel Wayfinder program. The link is below. Otherwise, I would highly suggest you just look for these five acts in the next book that you're reading and see how they play out. They have worked for centuries for a reason. So I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, it really helps my channel if you can like and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Happy writing.